Hello everybody, welcome to Statistics and Theory. Uh, I'm Dr. Vahid Aryadus from the National Institute of Education of NTU of Singapore. And I'm delighted to talk about poverty, the brain and academic performance in this lecture. So let's get started with the effects and the relationships of these three variables. Okay, uh, for starters I would like you to think about this question and perhaps just jot down some points about uh, what is in a test score. In other words, when we are looking at a test score or grade or mark, uh, what do you think it's representing? You can come up with a list and then uh, we will talk about that list later. This lecture is mostly based on the two chapters, chapter 1 and 2 of this wonderful book by Eric Jensen which is entitled Teaching with Poverty in Mind. I highly recommend it. It's, it's really a, one of those books that every educator should have in their bookshelf. Okay, with these preliminaries uh, in mind, we I, I would like to start by uh, presenting the first slide, which is about uh, the relationship between family income and some of the correlates of family income. So, as Jensen says, family income correlates significantly with children's academic success, especially during the preschool, kindergarten, and the primary years. What this indicates is uh, those first few years of our life uh, have a much stronger relation, uh, relationship with our family income. And if we're coming from a higher income family versus a lower income family, chances are that our fate will be quite different as research shows and I'm going to talk about this idea further in this presentation on the left hand side you will see a very uh, interesting uh, uh, visualization of um, equity versus equality I think uh, it's, it's really something for us to think about when we uh, design our tests and when we think about the test scores of our students so I'll leave this to you and you know, of course you can you know spend as much time as you would like to to think about the idea of equity versus equality. Now poverty uh, has been defined in a variety of ways and Jensen basically points out that poverty is a chronic and debilitating condition that uh, results from multiple adverse uh, synergistic risk factors and affects the mind body and soul. Now whether or not you believe that there is something called soul or, or even uh, you believe uh, in the duality of the mind and, and the body, I think the uh, idea behind this uh, quotation is pretty clear and straightforward. Poverty affects humans um, at the deepest level of our cognition, emotion and, and also in uh, on our social behavior. Um, I presented this in a class uh, and I, w I wanted to engage students in a, in a group work before I uh, talked about the different types of poverty. Uh, if you like, you can stop the video here and think about or Google these concepts. Situational poverty, generational, absolute, relative, urban and rural poverty and then come back to the video again. For the time being, I think I want to just move ahead and present the definitions of these types of poverty as a preface to the presentation. Situational poverty is generally caused by a sudden crisis or loss uh, and is often uh, temporary. So pretty much like the uh, global pandemic that we're facing nowadays. A lot of businesses were lost, a lot of people lost their jobs and as a result they probably ended up in a temporary situational poverty. Now, events causing situational poverty include environmental disasters, divorce, severe health problems, the global pandemic which I mentioned, etc. On the other hand, generational poverty occurs in families where at least two generations have been born into poverty. So families living in this type of poverty are not equipped with uh, the tools to move out of their situations. So this is a sort of poverty that is basically uh, hand down from previous generation to the generations to come and it will probably be more debilitating in the sense that because previous uh, generations didn't have 
uh, the tools to m move out of the equipment, so they even didn't recognize those tools. As a result, it was difficult or impossible to teach their younger generations or the future generations how to move out of that situation. So generational poverty is usually difficult to tackle, perhaps even more difficult than other types of poverty. And there is another type which refers to uh, the, um, the scarcity of basic necessities such as shelter, uh, running water, and food. And this is known as absolute poverty versus relative poverty. Um, Jensen claims that it's rare in the United States, but I'm sure that it exists anywhere in the world, even in our um, affluent uh, society, Singapore, it does exist. Uh, we can't deny it. Um, the, the problem is that the families who live in absolute poverty tend to focus on uh, you know, day-to-day -day survival and therefore they don't have a plan, like a long-term plan for, for the, their own future, the future of their kids, uh, etc. Uh, relative poverty is probably less severe than absolute poverty and refers to the economic status of a family whose income is insufficient to meet its societal uh, or society's average standard of living. So they are usually below average, below the mean of the society. For example, if they fall within one standard deviation below the mean of uh, the society's um, average income, um, well, they are uh, relatively poor, and if they fall within two standard deviations, I think the poverty is m much worse. And as you uh, move away uh, from the mean of uh, the uh, standard living of the society towards the negative side, uh, you get uh, increasingly closer to the condition of absolute poverty. So I, I would look at it as a continuum where relative poverty could ultimately result in absolute poverty depending on how much, depending on, uh, on the uh, amount of uh, equipment or facilities that a family has access to. And there are two other types of poverty here uh, which uh, are you know, commonly used in um, economy and related fields. And one of them is urban poverty and the other one is rural poverty. Urban poverty refers to a condition in, uh, in which um, poor people are living in metropolitan areas with populations of at least 50,000 people. In these conditions, uh, the urban poor have to deal with a complex aggreg aggregate of chronic and acute uh, stressors. And I'm going to get back to these two terminologies because they're very important and they do uh, exert negative and adverse impacts on the brain of especially kids. So let's keep this in mind and I'll get back to this. Some of the problems uh, that result in stress, constant uh, chronic stress or sometimes acute stress include crowding, uh, violence, noise in the neighborhood, other crimes, vandalism, abuse, child abuse, um, and within the family it could be corporal punishments, lack of um, attention and care for the kids, etc. And um, so they're dependent on uh, often inadequate large city uh, services. I mean, those people who are living in um, urban poverty are often dependent on um, the large city services, which are, as you know, most of the time are not very adequate. Okay, and rural poverty is also a similar concept, but it occurs in non-metropolitan areas with populations uh, which are below 50,000 people. So in rural areas, there are uh, more single guardian households, uh, families that are often uh, less uh, that often have less access to services com compared with those who live in the metropolitans and big cities, and there is relatively less support for disabilities and quality education opportunities are uh, fewer if you compare them with uh, the, the urban areas. Everything else equal. Uh, and, in, and of course this might be different in different countries around the world but generally speaking this is pro probably the profile that makes sense in many if not all areas in the world okay so uh, 
there is also some sort of uh, uh, at, uh, concept, conceptualization of the effects of uh, adverse poverty on children from the, the conception, I don't know if you can see the bottom of uh, the slide here, but this is conception, from the uh, conception of children who are born in, with poverty, um, they start to uh, experience more adverse childhood experiences as compared with those kids that are not uh, born in uh, poverty. So uh, I'm afraid the adverse conditions start even from you know, in uh, in the prenatal period, and from the moment that they are born, uh, those adverse conditions start to uh, kick in, and then uh, as they grow up, they start to face more relatively more social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. What I want to stress here is that if someone is is born in poverty, it doesn't mean that they will necessarily have to experience social, emotional, and uh, cognitive impairment. What I mean is that there is a higher likelihood or probability that uh, low SES or poor people would encounter these problems compared with people who are born in high SES uh, uh, background families. So I'm talking about probabilities here. In addition, uh, as Jensen goes on, uh, there will be a higher likelihood of, of adoption of health risk behaviors and in worst case scenarios you 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 will hear more about the disease disease disability and social problems in uh, poor areas and districts and ultimately the worst case scenario is early death ultimately because of the disease disability lack of uh, health care or proper health care lack of uh, access to uh, facilities that other people would have access to and well uh, early death is not very much far-fetched uh, under these circumstances. Now I would like to provide you with a very basic formula. I'm not saying that this formula is uh, comprehensive but I think it helps us to talk about the um, effects of poverty on academic uh, performance. Uh, my concept uh, is that uh, academic performance which is measured by tests or test scores is a function of the SES of the family, definitely the brain of the person himself or herself, and the teaching methods or the efficiency and efficacy of, of the teaching methods at school. Uh, as I will, uh, you know, show in, in later slides in this presentation, SES has a significant correlation with the brain and how the brain develops. And of course, uh, teaching methods also do have uh, an impact on how the brain develops. Um, all in all, SES and teaching uh, are actually environmental factors that affect uh, the students or uh, children's uh, brain development and growth. And that will have an impact on their test performance and their academic performance. I'll provide more statistics and more ideas about this very basic diagram. An example uh, that is provided again based on Jensen's uh, first and second chapter is right here at the bottom of the slide. So uh, let's say that we're looking at a person who was born in a low SES or very low SES family background. Uh, so this person or the child of this family wants to go to school. Now, the immediate problem that they encounter is that uh, is the transportation. Do they have access to transportation or not? Um, another problem that they would encounter is healthcare systems and, and also family care just inside the family itself because the research shows that most often low SES families are, you know, more busy and they, because they're, uh, mostly out of the job and they're looking for jobs or looking for um, you know resources for the family they may not have a lot of family interactions so the amount of family care would diminish this results in uh, tardiness and ab absentism uh, tardiness uh, refers to the, the delay of doing assignments or you know submitting 
what they're supposed to submit at school and absenteeism is very you know obvious the the children start to ditch the school or, or you know not show up in the class for the reasons that are mentioned here so we're we're looking at a very complex network in which ultimately the academic performance is not really about how much they tried to learn um, and how much they uh, um, you know they paid attention to the teacher but it's more about the effects of other factors which we may, which may be very latent and not visible um, immediately to us like transportation health care family care etc a lot of factors that um, I'm afraid our tests are completely blind to and as a result as test developers we need to take them into account um, let me just draw a brief conclusion here before move on before moving on to the next slide what I want to say here is that therefore test validation and test development should not be uh, limited to a bunch of statistical and psychometric analysis using IRT and all of the models that I have presented in this cha channel but it should be far beyond that and in order to do that we need to take into account the background of the kids who take the tests and also ask ourselves if it's fair to compare the kids that are coming from this background with the, the, the kids that are coming from high SES backgrounds. Can we compare them? That's a question. Um, again, research shows that there is a high dropout rate uh, among low SES uh, children compared with those who come from high SES backgrounds. That's another factor to take into account. Now I have been talking about SES and the question arises as to how we can measure SES. Well I'm suggesting that SES can be viewed as a latent variable or latent factor represented by this oval shape. So latent meaning that it's not something observable. In, in other words we can't point our finger to something uh, tangible and concrete and say hey this is this is what I mean by SES but we can measure it by using indicators so the first indicator of SES is education the educational background of the family and the person the kid um, then the, the other one is income and income is further indicated itself by personal income by familial income and by the total income of the family the next one is the occupation and industry, especially of the parents, and finally the family size. The family size and their relationships. The family size is very important. Uh, let me just give you an example. Let's say a family's income is uh, $30,000 per year. Now this family consists of only two people. So two people. Now there's another family which earns thirty thousand dollars a year but this family consists of six people so you can see that the, the SES of these two families could be extremely different because the amount of money that is earned is here is, is shared between six people whereas this is just between two people so it, it does have a significant influence next is uh, there are some subjective uh, measures of SES as well so while these are more objective on top the last one is the last group of variables that can be used to measure SES or to indicate SES is more subjective and it refers to the occupational prestige absolute or relative poverty measures and especially subjective social status measures that we can use we can for example create a questionnaire in which we uh, we measure the uh, social status of uh, some sort of occupation from a subjective perspective and that's from the perspective of people and how they perceive the status of that occupation and of course that would probably correlate somehow with SES but it will not be as objective as these variables that I have identified there 
So this is about SES and how it can be measured in short and in brief. Um, there's a lot more to it, I'm sure, but I think this just provides us with a brief, um, short and sweet background to measurement of SES. Now, um, what I would like to uh, stress is the fact that, because I talked about test performance, is that um, there are other indicators that we can also take into account when we are investigating the SES of people and these in indicators have been shown to have an adverse impact on test performance. I'm afraid um, uh, some of them have a very significant adverse impact on test performance and according to this uh, figure which uh, was adopted from uh, Koger and colleagues in 2005 um, the amount of pesticide exposure has a huge impact on the on the cumulative decline in test performance, something between 80% and and 100%, pretty close to 100%. The impact is, they they uh, speculated the the impact is that high, and uh, pesticides um, are usually used in rural areas, for example, farmers and gardeners, and if you think about it, if a farmer does not own the farm or the garden, uh, gardener does not own the garden and they're only working on uh, you know, the farm or in the garden, um, chances are that, and I'm not saying that this is 100% true, but chances are that these guys are probably coming from low SES families. So they're m exposed to pesticide more than the rest of the society who are not working on that, f on that farm or on, uh, in the garden the orchard for example. Uh, in the same way neurotoxic agents uh, um, well um, endanger low SES families more than high SES families for example some neurotoxic um, agents are like uh, lead for example lead poisoning is really a big problem st is still a big problem in the world. The poverty income you know, has an impact, a negative impact of between uh, 70 and maybe around 90 percent. Inadequate schooling, poor nutrition, this is this is also important. I'm not surprised to see that if people are, uh, uh, children are not uh, nourished well before going to school, uh, they will not perform well in the test as well. Uh, teen pregnancy, uh, prenatal, a uh, poor prenatal care, which has an effect between 60 to 80 percent negatively, maternal tobaccos and maternal consumption of drugs, because anything that they, uh, the mother inhales or ingests uh, can be quickly absorbed by the, uh, by the child, and, um, and also low maternal education and unsupportive home family. They have you know, different types of negative effects on the test performance. Again, another conclusion to draw here is that the academic or test performance of test takers is not just about their language ability but or anything else, any other abilities that we're measuring, but it's basically uh, affected by a lot of other factors which may remain unknown to us. So as a test developer, we need to make sure that we know our test takers pretty well. Now, what are the effects of poverty? There are four effects, four general types of effects, uh, which Jensen uh, has synthesized from the available literature, including emotional and social challenges, acute and chronic stressors, cognitive lags and cognitive declines, and health and safety issues. All of these affect the brain, as I will speak in a, in a minute, and the brain, of course, uh, the brain that is affected by these will have uh, you know suboptimal performance on tests and as a result the test scores and academic performance will be affected severely by these factors. Um, I will particularly show how these factors can affect uh, Perisylvian or language system. Okay let's get started with emotional and social challenges and I'm sure Many of you have watched this movie uh, uh, Inside Out. Um, well, 
there are five characters in that movie and they represent what we call basic emotions of humans of course basic emotions are six one of them is joy anger surprise disgust uh, sadness and fear um, you can trace back the concept of basic emotions to Charles Darwin who believed that humans and other primates are equipped with or are, are wired for these basic emotions and therefore um, uh, the way that we can distinguish whether someone for example is happy or anger uh, is just by looking at their face uh, because you know basic emotions can be easily represented in the face or the facial expressions of people or even primates like chimpanzees there's uh, quite some research that shows that chimpanzees can smile, can show anger, just through their facial expressions. So th this makes us uh, pretty much even closer to our closest cousins, like chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, whose genetic material is about 98.6% the same as that of humans. But there is another group of... Um, uh, emotions that need to be taught to the kids and this is where I want to stress the significant role of caregivers and the family so um, and also the, of course teachers at school so if caregivers love and guidance and support is there for the kid it can result in what we call an attunement um, and it's basically a reciprocal interaction between the kids and and the other people around them um, some of those you know emotions that I'm talking about are forgiveness or uh, forgiveness um, gratitude empathy and you know things like that so for, as an example empathy is uh, a kind of ability uh, by which the child is able to see how other people feel and can also feel the same thing as uh, other people for example you see that someone is in pain or uh, is suffering from something and you feel very sad by looking at them this is because of our mirror neurons in the brain um, so people who are more empathetic have probably have got more developed mirror neurons in the brain in the sense that uh, they can easily identify the feeling in other people around them and mirror that feeling or emotion at the same time this is also referred to as attunement as I mentioned before so we need to teach kids uh, whether at school or at home about forgiveness about gratitude and empathy etc now the problem is that those caregivers who are overworked or overstressed or authoritarian or basically uh, create less healthy environments for the kids as Yvonne uh, in uh, 2004 has shown so um, and this this is particularly true for the kids who are coming from low uh, SES families I'm afraid they have less self-esteem on average and they are prone to depression powerlessness and they express less empathy with the rest of uh, the people around them and there is gap gaps in their politeness they may act socially awkwardly but the prob uh, but this problem should not be taken as uh, you know the kids being so by nature it's because of the environment in which they were raised so at schools we must teach cooperation patience empathy gratitude and forgiveness as much as we can and engage all of the kids in activities in which they can practice patience empathy etc uh, so in a sense we will be able to overwrite the effect of those negative factors on the kids as much as we can but if if even the school itself does not uh, you know take any steps uh, to instill these values in the kids I'm afraid um, you know when they grow up uh, there will be a group of overworked again overstressed authoritarian people at the same time so um, it's it's like a network of connections and relationships between caregivers schools the environment and a lot more 
Um, I would like to ask a question and if you're interested to answer this question please leave the comments below this video. Um, what are other action steps that uh, schools should take to enhance equity because if a kid comes from a low SES background um, they may need to work on the uh, for example cooperation patience empathy of this this key this these kids and this is one step towards creating equity at school what are other steps that you think uh, can help us um, enhance equity at school the next uh, factor that I mentioned before is uh, the presence of acute and chronic stressors according to Jensen uh, a, uh, I mean, stress is a, a physiological response to the perception of loss of control resulting from an adverse situation or person. Okay, so uh, there is a lot about the chronic and acute uh, stresses. The first thing that they do is that they disrupt homeostasis. Homeostasis is that um, uh, our ability to cope with and adjust uh, in the face of problems. In, um, so some of these problems are physical and some of them are mental. For example, when someone is being criticized harshly or when, when we're being neglected, uh, that causes stress. Uh, also social expulsion, malnutrition, drug abuse, toxins, abuse, uh, physical punishment, violence at home, corporal punishment, trauma, overcrowding, evictions, utility disconnections, and a lot more can create stress. Now, how we cope with this type of stress is important because it's impossible to create an isolated uh, vacuum in which there is no stress. There is always some stress in our daily life. But the problem is, uh, if you're constantly exposed to some sort of stress, these stressors affect our neurons. And the effect is quite resounding in the sense that the neurons that are affected will be weaker and they will have weaker signals they, they will handle less blood uh, blood flow and they process less oxygen and they extend fewer connective branches and one of the important uh, things or factors when it comes to learning is to extend uh, connective branches I mean for the the neurons to extend connective branches. They, they create new circuits and new connections through which we, we, we are able to learn new skills or new knowledge. So when our neurons are not uh, capable of doing that because of our exposure to chronic and acute stressors, I'm afraid we're gonna uh, you know have some lacks and lags in our learning. More about acute and chronic stressors. I would like to stress that uh, there are two regions, particularly two regions in the brain that are affected the most. And when it comes to education and academic performance, these regions are important to take into account. The first one is the frontal lobe, as you see in this uh, photo right on top. This is the, our frontal lobe. Uh, as a result of chronic stresses, especially chronic stresses, the size or the volume of our frontal lobe can shrink. Now, what makes a problem is, uh, creates a problem is the stress hormone cortisol. And one of the responses of the frontal lobe to an abundance and uh, continuously flowing amount of cortisol is uh, shrinking. It shrinks compared with the brains that are not constantly exposed to you know, cortisol. Uh, in frontal lobe, there is an area which is called the prefrontal cortex, which is around uh, this area. This is the prefrontal cortex of people, uh, which handles critical thinking, planning, rational thinking, regulating impulsivity, and in language uh, processing, it also handles top-down processing, for example, in comprehension. We have identified this in our labs here, in our uh, uh, you know studies that this area is connected with top-down processing um, now I would like to give an example of regulating impulsivity 
For example, you enter a restaurant and you see that a lot of people are eating very delicious food and you're starving. But what you will not normally do is to go to one of the tables and grab the food from you know, the dish of someone who's eating and eat it. Uh, although, you know, that would make sense, in a, uh, biologically that would make sense because you need energy and there's a lot of source of energy there for you. But socially, it's, it's not acceptable. So the part of the brain that allows you to think uh, in terms of social norms and as a result to regulate that impulse that you have is the prefrontal cortex. And there is some research that shows that the people whose prefrontal cortex has been damaged but basically uh, they basically forget the social uh, skills and they totally become a different person and they start losing their friends. Um, well, chronic stresses can affect people in the same way. Now, when hippocampus, uh, s sorry, the, the other section uh, or the region of the brain is hippocampus. When hippocampus uh, is impaired, uh, the amount of learning is reduced and also there will be less uh, ability to learn declarative knowledge. Now, what I'm going to show you is the location of hippocampus in the brain. Um, he, here is a, is a very good and useful website. I'll leave uh, the address of this website in the comments section under this uh, video. Feel free to go through this. It's, it's very useful. So hippocampus uh, is a part of our limbic system. And limbic system is in, in uh, charge of regulating learning as well as emotions. So it has several sections. Most uh, pertinent to this uh, presentation are amygdala and hippocampus. Let's start with hip hippocampus. It's right here. You know, is uh, responsible for long-term memory, as you see here. It communicates with the rest of the brain via uh, uh, intrahenal uh, cortex. And there's two of them. One is in the right hemisphere, and the other one is the left hemisphere, right here. And you can actually look at this from different angles. It's a wonderful website. Right. Um, so this is about hippocampus and also all right, I'm going back to the slides. So hippocampus uh, regulates uh, working mem uh, sorry long-term memory. Uh, when it reduces or in, in size or when it's impaired, what happens is that our learning is impaired and our long-term memory is also impaired. So according to Joseph in 1999, the overproduction of stress hormones atrophies the brain regions that control social and function uh, social functions, empathy, and anything important for emotional development, and particularly uh, hippocampus and hippocampus and, and amygdala. Amygdala is the emotion center of the brain, and basically there are two amygdalas, one in each uh, hemisphere, and they look like Amens are most their amen size, and so that's that's why they, they've been called amygdala. Um, what happens to amygdala is that those stresses, especially the stress hormone, if it's uh, uh, released constantly in the blood, uh, results in an increase in the complexity of neurons. So, uh, you know, the center for emotion, which is more complex than other centers, probably means. Uh, a lot more emotions than uh, critical thinking and uh, and rationality. So I'm going back to to show you amygdala here. Yeah, these are the amygdalas, one on the left side and one on the right side. You know, from different angles. Um, so it's small and it's almond shaped and it's, it's an important part of the brain. Right. Uh, there, there's one more concept, and that's uh, the concept of um, allostatic load or carryover stress, which is due to the unmediated constant stress. Under these circumstances, because the person has, uh, you know, has received a lot of stress in the environment in which he or she is living, uh, they become uh, hyper-responsive or uh, hyper-responsive 
to the stress uh, or anything around them. For example, if we are living in a, in, a, in a war zone where a lot of people are dead every day on a daily basis, uh, we will have uh, less um, reactions or less severe reactions to the side of the death uh, the, the the side of the dead on the on the ground, for example, compared with someone who has never seen dead bodies around us, this is a part of uh, this carryover stress which makes us less responsive, or in some cases extremely more responsive to what is happening around us. Therefore, um, SES can result in uh, high amounts of acute and chronic stresses, and these can affect the brain and uh, the brain can basically uh, well function quite differently when we are taking the test. Another uh, effect of stress, uh, of poverty, and of course stress is cognitive lag. Research shows that SES is correlated with the IQ of people, their achievement, um, the, the scores on achievement tests, their grade repetition or retention, and also their literacy. Uh, so SES is really, really important factor we should take take into account. Um, well, um, there, therefore, there is a connection between SES and the brain as well. Um, what I would like to show here is this research, which was published by Romeo and her colleagues in, uh, I think the journal is called Psychological Studies or Psychological Research. Uh, it's a wonderful study that, uh, you know, shows how SES can bring about a whole bunch of differences among people. Now, of course, they do not use SES directly in the study, but they do review SES and its effect on the test performance of kids, and that's composite, for example, composite language scores. In their study, they show that the number of conversational turns between caregivers and kids at, at home uh, can significantly predict their test scores at school. Not only that, but also has a, a, a kind of indirect effect on test scores through the IFG part of the brain, which stands for inferior frontal gyrus. So IFG in this study was uh, was found to be more active in those families where there were more conversational turns between the kids and their caregivers. And as a result of this more activation, the kids had a higher score with a beta or regression coefficient of 0 0.235. Uh, so in other words, when uh, IFG goes up by one standard deviation, uh, the composite score goes up by two point, by sorry, uh, zero point two three five standard deviations, and that's quite significant to take into account. Now the thing is that these conversational turns are more in those families which have got higher SES backgrounds. And so if they're coming from lower SES, it's more likely to see less or fewer conversational turns be between the child and the caregiver. So it doesn't allow them to, for example, think critically about things around them. They will be more like a hearer than a uh, conversationalist in these environments, whereas the kids that are raised in these environments are basically, uh, uh, you know, a race to converse, to think, and to think out loud and to question and, and to express their thoughts more easily than the kids that are in these families and that's well uh, one of the sad effects of of the effect of SES on achievement tests through the brain of the kids and these are some parts of the brain which I think are important for anyone who is interested in learning about uh, the science of learning or um, uh, you know how the brain affects our test performance 
or our academic performance at school. There's a prefrontal part, uh, the parietal lobe is important too, the occipital lobe which is right at the back of the head, and temporal lobe, and uh, cerebellum which is right here the, uh, the base of the brain here it's it's good to you know familiarize ourselves with these con with these names and also learn how uh, these parts of the brain function and what they they are able to do uh, there's more uh, research about the relationship between SES and test performance for example uh, uh, Ransdell in 2012 uh, found that on average across all grades close to 60 percent of the variance in internationally referenced FCAT that's Florida Comprehensive Achievement Test reading comprehension score scores is accounted for by poverty and that's mind-boggling that's really mind-boggling uh, if you think about it uh, how SES and poverty can affect the test scores of students that's really you know something for us educators and test developers to take into account and now you can think about the high stakes test in your country do you think that we are looking at the at the same image or do you think that the image is different another study uh, was by Calvo and Bailey stock in 2014 in which they found that middle class children outperformed working class children again high relatively higher SES background versus relatively lower SES background children um, they outperform the low SES in these measures for example nonverbal intelligence language tests assessing receptive vocabulary and attention based on picture naming and two tests of executive functioning and th this is usually done in the uh, prefrontal cortex is regulated in the prefrontal cortex uh, as I mentioned before stresses can shrink prefrontal cortex and it might be that those children who are work, living in working class families uh, might have a different uh, different sort of wiring in their prefunctional cortex uh, sorry prefrontal cortex uh, altogether uh, these data indicate that the impact of SES was equivalent for both monolingual and bilingual children. As you know, there is some research that shows that bilingual ch children have some impact, uh, sorry, have some uh, uh, advantage over monolingual children. But the interesting thing is that uh, SES here is a more uh, powerful or a stronger predictor of the performance of children on tests. Uh, compared with being monolingual or uh, bilingual. And another study again that shows the effect of SES, especially on language development, is a study of infants. So the effect of SES can be traced back as to uh, as far as uh, you know our infancy years. So low SES infants scored eight points lo uh, lower on average than the higher SES infants in the total language uh, on the total language composite, five points lower on the auditory communication composite, and ten points lower on the ex uh, expressive communication composite. You see, the effect of SES can be this strong. Even infants who are born in uh, born to low SES families are outperformed by those who are born in, in a in a different environment. So, in conclusion. Uh, I would like to um, present this diagram, which was uh, adapted from uh, Brito and Nobel in 2014. This beautifully and very efficiently summarizes everything I've discussed so far. SES, which can be measured by indicators like income, education, uh, occupation, neighborhood, subjective status, etc., um, can predict or affect linguistic environments of children and also can affect or predict the amount of stress that they uh, experience every day. Now when it comes to linguistic environments, the left hemisphere or the la language cortex as I showed before, uh, the perisylvian uh, cortex which I showed before, uh, basically affects or regulates uh, and processes language input and output. Uh, so SES can affect this and this. In other words, 
a language score does not necessarily mean the ability of the, the person purely, but it, it could mean the effect of SES. Like I said, SES can result in stress depending on what kind of SES we are coming from. So we are more prone to chronic and acute stresses. This can affect the hippocampus and amygdala, that's the long term memory. This is for center for emotions, as you remember, and this is prefrontal cortex for rational thinking and top down processing. Right? As a result of this, uh, our cognitive control and, and self-regulation skills can be affected and as a result of too much stress uh, and its impact on amygdala our social emotional processing can be affected and as a result of uh, the effect of stressors on our hippocampus our memory can be affected and these are those skills that we primarily use for tests uh, even social emotional processing can still be used in tests, for example, in tests of speaking, in which we need to show pragmatic competence, which is closely connected to this. So the brain is affected by stress, which in turn affects language tests as well. And this is another way of uh, looking at the effects of stressors and cognition. I've already talked about them. I mean, you can pause the video here and uh, go through the diagram. Okay, this brings me to the end of this video. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you liked it. And if you really find it useful, please give it a like. And feel free to leave comments about the content that I've presented in the comments section. Have a great day.